Hello everyone and welcome back to the third installment of the Hope Initiative's Beethoven Sonatas project. My name is Angela Yi and today I'll be interviewing seven pianists performing Beethoven Sonata Opus 81A in E flat major, otherwise known as the Les Adieu Sonata. This sonata is very special because it is Beethoven's only explicitly programmatic sonata. He composed it after Napoleon invaded Vienna in 1809, which forced his dear friend and patron Archduke Rudolf to flee the city. As a result, this sonata describes Beethoven's emotions as he has to deal with saying farewell to and the absence of his dear friend. And finally, in the third movement, the joy at Rudolf's return. So let's get right into it. Please welcome your first movement performers. Yeah. So can y'all first introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Nancy and I'm a rising junior from the Bay Area and I've learned play piano for almost 11 years now. Um, I'm Yejin, and I'm also from the Bay Area, and I go to the Harker School, and I will also be a rising junior, and um, I study with um, Professor Hans Bopel, and I've played since I was five years old. Hi, my name is Justin Wabi. I'm currently a rising senior, and I played piano for 11 years, and I currently study under Dr. Natsuki Fukasawa, as well as Dr. John McCarthy at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music Pre-College. Hello, um, I'm Antonio Ahero. Most of my friends call me Neo. I'm 16 years old. I'm about to be a rising junior. Uh, I'm from Nacogdoches, Texas, which is about two hours from Houston. And I go to Nacogdoches High School. Outside of piano, what have y'all been working on, especially since it's summer now and everyone has a lot of time? I do run a music club at school, so what we've been doing is holding a summer music camp for younger children, so it's actually this week, so I've been busy with that. Um, I've been doing like a variety of things for fun. I've like finally tried to finish watching like Gossip Girl. <laughs> Um, which I've been trying to do for a while. And then I'm also like actually reading. I've been doing a couple of college courses and like um, I'm the major that I want to um, go into in college, perhaps some, something in the business field. So I've been doing that as well as uh, uh, internship related to the business field as well. I'm taking summer classes. I'm doing AP statistics. No, no not AP statistics, just statistics. I'm also... Uh, jogging almost every day. If I'm not jogging, I go to martial arts class. I'm set to be in two online piano festivals. The first one, which I'm in the middle of right now, is Art of Piano, hosted by the University of Cincinnati. In August, I'll be in the Philadelphia Young Pianists Academy. What composers do y'all play works from most often, or maybe a period of music? And when it comes to Beethoven specifically, how do you think you treat Beethoven works differently? I think the most like pieces that I've played from are from Beethoven, Chopin, and recently Liszt. And um, since Beethoven is like a turn point composer from classical to romantic, I think his pieces require a really good balance of like the classical technique and also like more expressive emotions throughout the piece? My, well, my favorite period is like the romantic period and I also play a lot from there. I remember like my teacher always said like Beethoven is always about like the different characters. The romantic era I would say is probably my favorite like I think my favorite period is going to be the romantic era. What are everyone's favorite Beethoven sonatas? Hammer Clavier. I definitely like the late sonatas a lot like I love Opus 110 and Opus 109. Yeah, no one can be hammer the best. And also the um, last sonata, the the boogie woogie section. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but other than that, great sonatas in general. I've played the first movement of the Hunt, which is Opus thirty one three, and it's kind of like it's pretty early. So I think the four movements are really unique in their own ways. So it's really fun. <laughs> and also 81A and 109. For 81A specifically, what's your favorite part of either part of the first movement or just generally? I wanted to play the piece because of the intro. I think the, the thing that really drew me into the piece, it was um, the, well, it is towards the end, not, not because it's over, but because like, you know, the lingering like um, octave C with the lower 
G, E flat suspension in the left hand and the scale leading up to it, I find that quite beautiful. And that's what really led me into the piece. So I think that's my favorite part. I know Yejin men mentioned this for the very first few bars of the first movement, the Lebewo motif. And of course it occurs over and over again in the first movement. So I was wondering if any of y'all treat the motif differently or the same each time it appears, or just anything special you do with it that you'd like to share? The way my piano teacher, like when we discussed it, we kind of like compared the first three notes to French horns. Like of course Beethoven's writing is overall quite orchestral. Maybe when I play it, the first time it's more expressive, second time it's more agile, the third time it's like very depressed. Probably the hardest one to do because it's, he makes it very subtle in like a lot of different spots. The idea of the overall theme of the sonata, which is saying farewell, farewell in Beethoven for the Archduke, is a pretty universal thing. Like most people have said farewell to a person, even simply and temporarily before. But I think each person has a very like, personal, individual experience with these emotions. And obviously that carries through your playing. So if anyone wants to share, if you have any specific either memories or images in your head, either from your own life or from literature or media you consume that help you guide yourself through the piece. I actually started the first movement like last July. So I was in Tanglewood back then. And the first time I performed it in front of people was at Tanglewood. So especially the adagio part of the first movement, it makes me recall a lot of Tangled memories, especially now in quarantine. Um, the second movement is something that I really enjoy playing because it means absence. So it's like right now we're in the absence of people and yeah. The reason I like even discovered this piece was I, Justin was also at this festival, but it was like the John Perry <laughs> Academy. Um, mm -hmm. It was like two years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's where like we heard it a lot and I like really wanted to play the piece. I was playing this piece. I think the theme of the sonata being farewell, you know, I think our felt farewell is like, I kind of think of it like, you know, in current situations where we had to you know, leave our normal routines. I drew a parallel with his farewell motif throughout these three movements with, I would say, the five stages of dealing with rejection, I would say. You first begin with denial in his first um, three bars, and then it's anger. I would say, you know that the Allegro section is quite bright and happy, but when you actually dissect it further, is he really happy there? Is he really active there? I would say the ending is kind of like, and the first one is like bargaining or saying like, kind of like rationalizing it out. Final question for this sonata, do you have any go-to recordings or just recommendations for recordings to listen to? I, I think like Baron Boy is just like a classic. I gotta go with Richard Good. My teacher recommended me to listen to Emil Gill's recording. My favorite, perhaps Beethoven interpreter would be Alfred Brendel. Thank you all for your time and for your input. And for the audience, I hope you enjoy the following performances by these four pianists for the first movement of Beethoven Sonata, Opus 81A in E flat major.
Now, after that first movement where Beethoven has said goodbye to the Archduke, the second and the third movements are titled The Absence and The Return, respectively. Because these two movements are continuous, I will be interviewing all three performers of the next two movements at once. So without further ado, please welcome our performers, Catherine Huang, Xu Heng Zhang, and Esther Pham. My name is Esther Pham. I am 16 years old and I'm going to be a senior in high school. Yeah. All right. Hi, my name is Catherine. I'm 18. I'm a rising freshman in college. And yeah. Hi, I'm Shu, and I'm also 18, and I'm also a rising freshman in college. Do all of y'all have different teachers now from when you started, and who are your current teachers? Uh, my current teacher is Dr. Thomas Ungar from TCU. Yeah. And I study with Professor Hans Bopold from the San Francisco Bay Area. He is superb. Yeah, I study with Professor Logan Skelton, who teaches at uh, the University of Michigan. Oh yeah, and Professor Vovel teaches at Santa Clara University. What have y'all been working on outside of piano, especially since it's summer now, we all have a lot of time. Um, I've been working on, uh, well, drawing, I guess, and writing some books for fun, mostly genres, like fantasy. Yeah, so during quarantine, I started Hope, which was really great. Um, it's great to have you guys on board. Um, I was not expecting it to grow this much. And yeah, we're just trying to bring music to communities, um, regardless of physical distance, even in our own homes. And we can do so creatively and from the perspective of youth. And this is exactly what we're all about. So there's that. I've also been teaching Spanish to younger kids in my community and taking some coding classes on my own. So I started um learning how to conduct a bit. I've been reading Max Rudolph's book on conducting. I've been familiarizing myself with a lot of repertoire outside of the piano repertoire, like a lot of symphonic and chamber works. I've been studying up a lot of music stuff. Like uh, I've been reading Strauss, not, not the famous Strauss's, but a current musicologist Strauss's book on like uh, post-tonal music theory, which is pretty interesting. What are y'all's plans for the future, either for in next year or just long into the future, whatever you want. Mm, I'm planning to major in piano performance, I guess. So in college, I'll be attending Harvard College in the fall. And for now, I plan on majoring in applied math or computer science while definitely keeping, continuing to play as much music as I possibly can. Right now, uh, same with Catherine, I'm also attending Harvard College. There, I hope to kind of expand my horizons on uh, just general education. Hopefully, I'll do something humanities and closely relate to music, something like English or something. But I hope to do music, uh, go to conservatory for like grad school and something. But ultimately, the goal is I, I really hope to advocate for a lot of reform and um the way music is taught in the U.S. I also plan on expanding musical outreach in college or like having Hope expand its activities to include music education in schools. What composers do you guys play most frequently and how does that differ from your, how does playing Beethoven differ when you like just approach the music since this is the Hope Beethoven project? Mm, I mean these days I'm starting to play like mostly contemporary music like by Scriabin or Ravel. And most of them is contemporary. So it was kind of hard to play classical, a classical composer like Beethoven. Yeah, um, for me throughout high school, I played a lot of works by Rachmaninoff, including um, his Rhapsody on Theme of Paganini, his second piano sonata. And that made has made Rachmaninoff become one of my favorite composers. Now in quarantine, I play a little more Chopin. And so all this romantic music does differ from Beethoven, fundamentally in style, because while rhythm is so important to every composer, it is the foundation of Beethoven's music. It is much of um, the rhythm in Beethoven drives a lot of the energy in his music and a lot of the character. And that's why it is so important to maintain that rhythm when you play. Of course, it is equally important in romantic music, but you do have more freedom in terms of timing, of course. Um, I don't know if there's any composer in particular that I play a lot of, but one that I really enjoy is a lot of uh, Debussy. And I think Debussy, aside from like compositionally, like stylistically, I think Debussy and Beethoven have a very fundamentally different approach to just how to play the keyboard. Because I think uh, Beethoven's music is far more 
percussive. Or Beethoven, who, what, which sonatas are your favorite Beethoven sonatas? Um, my favorite Beethoven sonata is probably my first one, Opus 10, number three, uh, number 12, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's the most polished Beethoven sonata I had. So that's why it's my favorite. Oh, so I'm going to say a really popular opinion, but I love late Beethoven. There's just something so spiritual and intimate about um, this time period it's music that Beethoven produced. It's just very different from his early music. You just really get to um, see the composer up close and personal. And of course, my favorite late Beethoven sonatas would be, is Opus 110, but I also like, like the less popular ones like Opus 101 and Opus 111. I'm playing 101 right now. It's so underrated. I love 101 is gorgeous. It's so yeah. underrated. Yeah. All the counterpoint late Beethoven. So like piggybacking off the of Catherine said. So obviously like there's a ton of early and middle Beethoven that's just wonderful. Like obviously 81A, um, <laughs> the Appassionato or Waldstein. But of course, like the late Beethoven sonatas are the best one. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to disagree with that because yeah. there's such a profound aspect to them. Like all all five late Beethoven sonatas are very very much strangely unique in in Beethoven's work, as all of his late works were. And I think Beethoven's late sonatas very much like any great work of art or literature you don't quite you you can't quite understand them fully ever like there's obviously a surface level of enjoyment you get and a slightly deeper emotional uh, philosophical level that you appreciate but there's always something that you can't quite grasp about these pieces especially because of how simple they are at times like the like my favorite one is opus 111 and like just the the idea that starts the second movement it's so simple i mean it, it just uses one four five one chords but something about how he molds everything is really profoundly moving yeah i totally agree with you about especially like for example in 110 that's the popular sonata that a lot of us know and the ariosos are all arias they're built off of um bel canto opera and yeah sure you just think about them as like melodies that you need to sing out but the emotional depth that lies beneath these melodies is something that like kids our age, we just really cannot comprehend because we do not live through the experiences that someone like Beethoven has, like the pain, the tragedy, and we can only do our best to try to empathize with those emotions when we play. Well, that's why um, working on these late Beethoven sonatas is lifelong work. It's something that we should just keep working on, keep carrying with us, keep building. Let's move on to this sonata specifically. Do y'all have a favorite part of the sonata that you want to share? Um, I like the third movement. It's like, it reminds me of a book. I don't know why. Fantastic Mr. Fox. I don't know why, though. <laughs> you know, I like the adagio section of the first movement. I can just spend hours practicing it, just like listening to every sound to make sure it just sounds every note is where it's supposed to be. And at the same time, all the lines are um, coherent and they flow. And that just takes so long to um, get a hold on. And it's just every day you just sound different it's just so um exciting to see like what you can do and like it's just an adventure even that one and a half minutes that first page of the sonata means so much to me yeah the the adagio that starts the first movement is absolutely wonderful to play like anytime you play just because it's the amount that's going on but it's not way too challenging that it's frustrating it, it really gets you in a state of like meditation or flow getting that really wonderfully expressive but i think with in terms of listening my favorite parts would be uh, probably the coda of the first movement and the coda kind of type thing in the third movement is just so poetic but that last part in the third movement is just wonderful because it kind of looks back at the whole spiritual journey that's happened and it gives you a very warm conclusion and then an exciting conclusion that's such a poetic ending to the piece, oh, I think. Yeah. Love yeah. that part too. But also, I find that when I play music in general, I don't think of that many experiences or even specific emotions because I find that the music itself already contains those. Rather, I focus on how to express what the music already contains, kind of like making sure I'm phrasing properly, making sure there's nothing sticking out badly and yeah, I think music contains 
enough information itself that mm -hmm. if you play it properly, it will say what it needs to say. Yeah, same. Sometimes I have trouble attaching explicit stories or experiences to certain musical passages. But I find that when I do, when I attach at least not really a memory, but the feeling that the memory is accompanied by, it really helps with expressing a certain passage. So as far as I am like Shuho in terms that like the music is my guide, but I also allow my life experiences to be um, the guide to my music as well sometimes, if that made any sense at all. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting because I always hear people say like you should think of specific images in your head while you play, but mm. for me because I cannot see images in my head, so it's just black. <laughs> so yeah, I totally agree that unless if it's like a very, very strong memory that you can attach for the most part, I think the music speaks for itself and it's really cool. Yeah. So since we want the music to speak, speak for itself, what are the most technically difficult parts of these movements specifically that you need to work on a lot to bring out those beautiful lines? I feel like the second movement is the hardest because um, even though it's slow, it's really hard to bring out the melody and make sure the um, bottom parts are soft. Yeah, and then the third movement in general, just the really fast tempo takes a lot of slow practicing to get those scales. And the scales, the rhythms of the scales, you have like triplets and you have 16 notes together in the left hand as well and the right hand. And it's just difficult to practice and to master at a high tempo. So there's that, yeah. Yeah, there's two absolutely brutal passages I'm thinking of in, in the entire piece. First, the chordal passage, uh, Catherine said that it's basically a scale melody, but yeah. each note's a, a chord. Mm -hmm. And in, in the third moment, it's a spot that doesn't sound very hard, but is absolutely just terrible. It's another <laughs> scalar passage, but it's, it's right after it goes, do, 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 and then yeah, goes, da, 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 da. <laughs> I haven't even played this, and I, I no longer <laughs> touch it. <laughs> <laughs> well i think that's about it thank you so much for your time and thank you thank you yeah thank you mm -hmm. yeah, the audience please enjoy the wonderful <laughs> by these three people all right bye thank you goodbye